My name is Matt Piper. I'm the Global Industry Solutions Director here at Esri. I'm based out of our Redlands, California office, and I've been here about four and a half years now. Um, and in that time, we've seen a lot of change already, not just in the Esri technology stack, but you know, in the evolution of what's happening in the industry. I'm pretty excited to be here um, on Geo Awesomeness. Uh, what a great name for a, a community meetup to get together. Uh, and I just want to thank Tony and um, Patrick for their presentations this morning because they've set this up really nicely that I don't really have to go too deep into the technical stuff that they're presenting so um, looking at what they've gone through I just want to share some of the innovations and the technologies and really what GIS is doing for utilities at the moment and how hopefully it gets you thinking about this notion of what we call the, the geographic approach and I guess the, the way of thinking spatial to solve business problems. And I always talk about this like as a relationship to my, my children in that almost everything they do now in their life is driven by something that's related to spatial. And it could just be my daughter driving up to the corner store. She always gets in the car. She starts the, you know, the navigation system with a map because she wants to find the most optimal route with traffic. So it saves her on petrol. Um, my son, whenever he goes for a jog, he'll always bring up um, his running app and he'll track everything before he does it on the map. Then he'll run it and you'll know how far he ran, how, what the elevation was, what his times were through all these different things. And then he shares that across you know, to all his friends to show off how good his running is. And the way that they think now is spatial and everything that they do has geography in it, but they don't even think of it like that. It's just ingrained into what they do. And we're starting to see now this adoption of that same way of thinking into organizations. And when you think about it from that perspective, almost every single problem that you come across within your organization has a spatial element and you can think of it and solve it using spatial technology. So I think it is a pretty exciting time in the industry. As I said, I've been in the industry for quite a long time, but it is rapidly a, um, innovation at the moment. The growth in innovation is really exciting. So when we look at some of these challenges that we're facing um, from the utilities perspective, I mean, it's it's climate change, it's urban population, it's these new resilience challenges, it's aging populations, it's sustainability. There's so many new challenges coming. And as I said, as a, as a young engineer coming through about 25 years ago, one of the benefits of being an engineer at the time was, well, the grid hasn't changed in a hundred years. So you could pull out a 20 year old textbook and you could learn how to become a power engineer because that's effectively how you manage the grid. If the load increased, you just built a new substation or you just extended a new bay at the end of the, um, the substation to pick up the new load. But really what we're seeing now is the grid is changing and the, the policies and the regulations are changing. And we really do need to think differently as an industry. So it's, it's actually forcing so much new innovation into this space. So for young people coming through or for you know, the, the innovators in this space, the, the opportunities are significant to think differently and challenge a lot of the ways that we've worked in the past. So what I'm going to talk through today is just really some of the ways we're seeing geography and the geographic approach being applied into some of these common workflows. And I'm going to start by looking at probably one of the most common workflows that we, we look at in a, in a utility and it's, it's, it's asset management. And this is something that I guess utilities have been doing forever. They've been putting assets you know, into a register. They've been managing them. Tony covered it off really nicely. Um, you know, we've, we've always ran utilities based upon what we would call routine maintenance. So we just go out in a cycle every two years, three years, four years, we go do maintenance. And we go do these inspections. Um, in the last number of years, we've been challenging that you know, methodology and starting to capture effectively failure um, or condition defects to understand, well, why are things failing? Um, but what that's driving now, and a better understanding of that, has a really heavy component on where it is. So an example is a wood pole near the coastline will have different failure rates to a wood pole inland. So it'll have, you know, um, potentially, you know, high rot um, based upon a wood pole. And a steel pole cl close to a coastline will have, you know, different failure rates to a steel pole in the coastline. So, you know, it'll have corrosion and stuff like that. So it's not just the, what type of asset it is, but where that asset is located is pretty important as well. And when you think about likelihood versus consequence, it could be that that particular asset is in a high fire zone or it's in a high wind zone. So it's more prone to conductor clashing. Um, it could be that 
it's in an area that's heavily populated near an urban area and it's at an intersection. So, you know, vehicle impacts or the consequence of that asset failing is close to a school. Location plays a pretty important role in understanding your asset management programs. And when you think spatially like that, you start thinking, well, we need to, we need to adjust our maintenance programs, not just on their age or their, you know, a likelihood of failure. It's where that asset is. And we start making better decisions to move to this condition based maintenance or financially optimized maintenance. That's really starting to drive and, and create new awareness in what we would you know, think about our asset planning or our programs of work for both our CapEx and OpEx work. When we, when we think about now taking that same concept and you know, traditionally indoors, it's just been a dot on a map. It's just a, it's just a single point. Now we've got the ability to take GIS indoors and do asset management indoors. So now we can look at our assets spatially and be floor aware, room aware. Um, we can start seeing all of our facility systems and assets uh, indoors as well. And we start now bringing those methodologies into place for, you know, understanding where things are indoors, how do I route to them in an optimal way? And of course, we just saw from Patrick, you know, and, and Tony, some of the great work we're doing in vegetation management. So in the space of vegetation management, you know, GIS now provides capabilities to do all of your flight planning, your drone inspections, your capture of all these imagery and LIDAR. It's big data capture. We have multiple tool sets now straight out of the box to do all the AI machine learning for things like object detection, encroachment, uh, vegetation management programs. So we're starting to see these programs of work now uh, bring in data sets at a huge scale or a huge volume of work and really automate a lot of these big data programs of work to create that you know, uh, awareness to optimize these maintenance programs. If we now move across. Another big trend we're seeing with GIS and the application of GIS is that we're bringing the GIS now into more of your operational workflows. So the first part is some of the relationships we're seeing now working into control rooms. So integrating your GIS and your ADMS, so a modern ADMS or DMS system. This is really starting to optimize our schedule and dispatch, knowing where our crews are, knowing where the assets are, knowing the weather patterns, um, how do we respond faster? We can do route optimization, work program optimization, managing those workforces to get people to the site to perform the work as quickly as possible. But it's also bringing that GIS into the control room to create that more spatial aware operation of your network. So your, your GIS now is coming in and being spatially aware in context to the layout of how the grid is operating. Uh, one of the biggest advances we're seeing now is how we take GIS out into the field. So now we're optimizing our field operations and programs of work. So this is, of course, probably about 50% of most of utilities are out in the field performing these assets inspections. Taking the GIS data and the integration into an ADMS, you can now take as the grid is operating for safety and you know, understanding the GIS to the people out in the field. I mean, that's really optimizing safety. It's improving these workflows and streamlining the data collection and capture of, of critical assets and information back into your source systems. Um, this can be something as simple as a customer disconnect workflow. It could be something as damage assessments or rapid rapid damage um, inspections uh, during major events. But it also is providing some of these safety things like geofencing. So more and more we see it's, uh, our field crews needing to be aware that they're, they're about to go into an area that may be a, veget uh, a cultural heritage zone. It could be something as simple as there's a dog on this property. You know, I just want to get an alert that I'm going into an area where I should be aware that there could be a potential hazard. One of the biggest advancements we've seen in the recent years, if you have been following the ESWIC technology stack as it relates to utilities, is the really the advancement in what we would call the underpinning information model. It's called the utility network model, but it is our latest information model that sits under the hood that runs and helps you model and manage a modern network. So this, this is really designed in a way to help utilities manage a modern grid. So if you think about the technology 20 years ago, as I said, the grid has really changed. The grid we have today is not the same as what it was 20 years ago. So we needed a new information model to help you manage and model what this new grid looks like. So this includes things like your distributed energy resources, but it is actually designed in a way that in one information model now, you can model from the generation through the transmission, through the distribution, all the way down to the customer and beyond the customer meter to understand that entire grid in a single information model. What it also does, it allows you to go across information models for different domains. 
So you can model the entire electric grid, but in the same information model, you can model your telecommunication network or your water networks or your district energy networks. And any impact on one of those networks, you can see the correlation to these other networks as well. So this is really transforming when you think about modern infrastructure management, you start seeing all these different models come together to help you make better business decisions. So this aggregates up to really help with things like smart cities and better understanding total infrastructure management as it relates to, I guess, coordination planning across those different domains. So I hope this is loading. So the other thing we're looking at now is um, how this is being applied across some really common workflows, but actually ensuring that there's no loss of information between these critical stages of how we perform work. So if you think about project management or project delivery, you have this workflow of we plan, design, we build, we operate and we maintain. So the GIS now is being used all the way through this different life cycle. So we have this, these capabilities for you know, reality capture and integration. So we're going out now and we have the ability to do imagery inspections and capture information and integrate that back into our source systems. One of those information models that we work with now is, is BIM modeling. So this ability to bring in really high resolution 3D BIM models, integrate that back into our GIS so we can see things in really high detail. Um, it's, it's, it's connecting those workflows for the design into a, into a level for utilities that we haven't been able to do before. So if you think about how you manage a substation or a water treatment plant, these are really helping us bring those assets to life in, in 3D visualizations. We can now move that along and understand projects and uh, their process and tracking throughout the project life cycle in both 4D and 5D. So as we move between you know, GIS and 3D, we can bring in things like time and cost and understand how those projects are tracking throughout their life cycle. And we integrate it into other systems you know, that are doing the project life cycle management as well. And finally, the other thing that's probably really leading the way here and how GIS is being pervasive across different industries is how it is enabling the sharing collaboration. And this is really helping or based upon what we call the service oriented architecture where our data is now pervasive and shared across, not just within your organization. So it's not just the asset management team, the GIS team, the operations team, but it's moving now across to be able to share it across organizations or across internal and external stakeholders. So your data that you're capturing, you're providing or you're sharing now is pervasive and can be shared across multiple organizations. This during these project management life cycles enables you know, the construction workers to be able to be consuming your data, be updating that data and sharing it back to you, and then be made available to other components of the project life cycle as well in real time. And this is streamlining that information loss. So it's not uncommon that a utility may be having the as constructed work life cycle, and they could be three months or, you know, getting those as builds back from the field and updated back into their source systems. Now we've been able to bring that back almost real time to say, as this data is captured, maintained and managed, it comes back into the source system and is updated seamlessly back into your integrations. This is really helping improve data quality and overall information lifecycle. The other big thing that we talked about um, as we set this up is the challenges that the utilities are facing now, where we need to think differently um, to solve some of these modern challenges. And this is really introducing this notion of what we call this you know, geographic approach, which is this, it's a way of, thinking spatially first for managing the design and planning um, operations and delivery of these projects. And it's based, done on a science-based approach where we're, we're starting to think differently on how we solve business challenges. Um, but my experience says that people just understand things better when they see it spatially. Uh, we can inherently comprehend really complex data sets in a way that makes it easily digestible and we can communicate that back um, across our organizations and to our stakeholders. And one of the biggest things we're seeing here is our GIS or geography is being used in providing this framework um, for understanding and applying that knowledge. And we're really having to now apply it into these new areas, which are, which are new for utilities. And it's about the social, it's about the economic and the environmental systems. And it's, it's really bringing all these different factors together because we're dealing with complex and sensitive data sets now. And you know, from my experience working in the utility, we struggle to even manage our own data. So just, you know, what is the make model serial number of our existing databases or our assets? And that was challenging enough. Now we need to start thinking, well, there's all these other data sets 
that are really important to help us make better decisions, but they're not our data. So how do we bring that in and how do we integrate and make better decisions um, on how we operate a modern network? And this is where we start seeing some of these, these challenges on what utilities are trying to solve. And this is where I think GIS can play a really important role in helping you move forward. So one of those areas where we're seeing a lot of, a lot of interest right now um, as, we, as we talk around the world is, is on sustainability. And how is GIS being used to help your organizations you know, move into a more sustainable uh, future? And as, as every utility is moving towards these sustainable development goals, we start thinking that this geographic approach is really going to be imperative um, to creating this sustainable future. So already GIS is being used uh, to help you with site situation awareness. So things like where do I put my um, solar farms? You know, where is the, the highest solar uh, potential? Where is the high wind areas? Uh, where, where, where are they connected closely to a transmission line to reduce losses? Um, situation awareness is important for site selection. We're starting to see more advancements in not just understanding, you know, based upon load, where do we put solar panels on people's houses, but actually what is the solar potential, not just of the house, but of the entire circuit. Uh, there's, a, there's a graphic showing on the screen here. You know, we're starting to see solar potential now of, of understanding entire cities and rooftops to understand using machine learning, how much potential based upon average hours of sunlight can we achieve by putting rooftop solar panels on rooftops. EV charging stations down the bottom there is one of the hottest topics right now in the industry. And there's a lot of work being done to better understand you know, using GIS, okay, where is the, where is the infrastructure required to support the amount of electric vehicles going to be coming onto the grid? How do we reduce range anxiety? How do we ensure that there's the right number of EV charging stations on the grid? Who is likely to purchase these electric vehicles in, in the next number of years? Uh, how is this going to impact our grid moving forward? Where do we need to introduce the new generation uh, to support this um, extra load onto the grid? So many questions are coming in uh, and they're all spatial. So, uh, and right now, there's a lot of work being done using GIS to help better understand the impact of EV charging stations and, and the impacts to the future grid. Another really important topic right now as we start seeing the impacts uh, to climate change is how do we make our networks more resilient? And typically when we talk about resilience, most people automatically go to, well, it's the, it's the impact to, to you know, the major events that we're having, these major disasters. And it is true, um, we, we are getting hit by you know, more natural disasters and they're, they're at a higher frequency and a higher ferocity than we've seen in the past. But it's, it's so GIS has been used to, to help understand, you know, how do, we, how do we plan, how do we respond, how to recover faster. But we're also seeing, as we talk about resilience now, well, we need to be resilient to what the modern grid's going to be. So what is the, as we just talked about, what's the impact to this, you know, changes in the new network models of, distribution of energy resources coming onto the grid. What is the future going to look like? How do we run these scenarios over the next one, five, 10 years to see how do we make our grid more resilient? There was a question earlier I thought it was interesting. Why don't we just put all um, power lines underground? Well, that's one way to improve resiliency, that this is true, but it does come at a cost. Uh, so, so, you know, there is, there is ways we're looking at how do we, how do we maximize our, or improve our resiliency in, in, in all these different ways. When I traveled to Bangkok a couple of months back, uh, we asked this question on a panel about resiliency and the highest topic for them was not about natural disasters, even though they do get their fair share of, of typhoons down in that region or hurricanes. What was most important to them was the cyber attack. So the, the, how do we make their networks more resilient to, as the proliferation of IATs and sensors and all these new technologies come on the grid, how do you make your grid more resilient to the cyber attacks? Where are we likely or vulnerable to cyber attacks on our network? So GIS obviously plays a role in helping understand where the vulnerabilities of your network and how you can better respond. As we look at equity, this is also a very important topic um, as we're moving forward and talking to our customers. Many communities are pro, um, prioritizing uh, the undeniable connection between their essential services, such as transportation, energy, clean water, and their telecommunications. And equity is now at the, I guess, at the core of a lot of their decision makings. There's a lot of investment programs coming out and grants that are being applied to address, you know, some of the historical injustices and underserved communities uh, that are being, you know, effectively impacted um, inadvertently by the infrastructure that's in those areas. So we're looking at how GIS can be applied 
uh, to solve some of these challenges. One of the one of the best examples I've seen of this was actually um, from an electric company, Dominion Energy. It was just up on stage. They presented at a conference, and they're using GIS to to bring effectively equity into the core of all their decision making. So in everything that they're doing right now, they look at it with an equitable lens. So they've got some amazing dashboards that they've produced that says, when we do planning or capital works planning in the future or operational work, they look at where these programs of work are running and then they look at the communities that are in those areas. They, they understand who it's gonna impact and they understand will this work, is this work and we're upgrading our networks done in an equitable way. They then extended that and they started looking at it from when we have a major event, such as a hurricane or a wildfire, when we go through and restore power, are we actually restoring power in an equitable way? And if you think about that, it's a really interesting notion. And it's not something that is at the forefront of most utilities way of thinking right now. Normally, power goes out and you'll restore power, critical infrastructure first, you know, highest load on the circuit, number of customers, get as many people back on as quickly as possible. Inadvertently, what may be happening there is that, are you really doing that in an equitable way? Because the people that um, are at the ends of the circuits and that, that are the, the extremities may always be a type of certain demographic, um, whether it's income or race or, or any, no, any number of those factors. And this is really starting to challenge and, and make utilities think differently on, you know, the, how they manage and operate their network in an equitable way. So I've talked a fair bit about a lot of the, the ways that GIS is being applied. I just want to circle back a little bit and, you know, um, come back to, well, how, do, how does all this work in our ecosystem? Well, Esri has hundreds of products, as you, as you no doubt know, um, and there's not one product that does everything. But what we do have is effectively solutions uh, to help solve many of these business challenges. Um, I've just called out a couple of the, the ways that we would frame this. So, in modern network management, we have some technology stacks there, how we deploy into mobility, how we're helping with real time, how you bring in a lot of this imagery and AI machine learning stuff that we, we, we saw today together from some of our great partners and customers. Um, if we're wanting to move into the 3D space, some of the technologies here. So something to keep in mind is that Esri invests about a third of its revenue back into R&D to always keep advancing this technology and to, to be moving it forward. So the technology is you know evolving rapidly, but it's done in a way that we're trying to always keep ahead or keep aligned with what our customers are asking. And as I said at the start, utilities are going through this rapid changes in, in what their capabilities are. And it's, it's exciting to see the technology keep pace with, with the effectively the emerging markets that we're seeing. So with that, I really do want to, I want to thank everybody for their time today. Um, and as I said, like a modern utility today, you know, we, we must set up the future of what this, um, modern network is going to be and the technology and the way that we apply the technology is going to be important important on how we you know design build and manage the, the infrastructure of the future so in the in the short term that really means prioritizing where to repair and where to build next in the long term it means ensuring that our critical assets can sustain a growing and migrating you know global population amid this climate change while expanding networks to serve more people in an equitable way so with that, I just want to, I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, my details are at the bottom here. If, if everyone wants to reach out, um, we're happy to, happy to answer any questions. With that, I'll pass it back to Mutar.